Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. We're starting um, at 10 a.m. Depending on where you are uh, joining us from, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest of, in E4C's 2016 webinar series on the topic of bringing the infrastructure and planning for the impact, best practices and lessons le learned from VecnaCare. My name is Mariela Machado, and I'm Program Manager here at E4C. I will be moderate, the moderator for today's webinar. If you're following us on Twitter today, I will also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Please uh, feel free to tweet uh, during the webinar or after. I would like now to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about today's webinar. Improving healthcare infrastructure in low resource settings requires system solutions that close the information gaps between patients, caregivers, and decision makers. The social enterprise VecnaCares designs and deploys information management and technology solutions, which help people live healthier and better lives in environments that have limited access to infrastructure, specifically power or internet access. Today, we're joined by Paul Amendola, the Executive Director of VecnaCare Chatterable Trust, who will take us through VecnaCare's eHealth solutions, key lessons learned and best practices deploying electronic and medical record solutions in low resource settings. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, before, before we get rolling, I would also like to thank the E4C webinar series team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the team via the email address visible on the slide. Uh, so the contact will be webinars um, at engineeringforchange.org as uh, seen in the slide at the moment. Today's webinar is part of E4C's professional development offerings, information on upcoming in installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations can be found on the E4C webinar, webinar's webpage. Our next webinar will be in January and will be shared details on our site, and E4C members will receive an invitation to the webinar directly. So before we move on to our presenter, I would like to tell you a bit more about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of over one million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities, including access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to relevant current news, data on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and opportunities such as jobs and fellowships. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve your resources aligned to your interest. We invite you to join for C's passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website, as, as seen in the slide, uh, engineeringforchange.org, uh, to learn more and sign up. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, let's see first uh, where everyone is from. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, of your screen please type your location. If the chat is not opening, uh, you can... Um, if the chat is not, is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the chat icon on the top right corner of the screen. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go into the chat window. Feel free to send a private message to Engineering for Change Admin if you have any issues. Let's see where everyone, everybody is from. Cambridge, Houston, New York, uh, Washington, D.C., for Annapolis in Brazil, welcome. Diego, I see uh, new, new, new countries today. Um, great. So you can also use the chat window to type any remarks you may have during the webinar. Please use the, the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenter that we will be doing the Q&A at the end of the session. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon on the top right corner. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in, the, in a different browser. Again, if you have any problems, please type uh, directly to uh, Engineering for Change Admin uh, through the chat. 
Um, an important uh, information is following the webinar to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for this session. Please follow the instructions on the top of E4C professional development page. Let's just get started. Um, it's now a pleasure uh, for me to introduce our speakers uh, today, Paul Amendola, who is um, the Executive Director of Vecna Care Charitable Trust, he previously worked at the Interna International Rescue Committee in Health Information Systems. Paul has designed and implemented data collection projects and epidemiology studies in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. His work focuses on increasing data, data quality through data training, reviewing and advising on information systems and database creation. Paul is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We also have um, we also have today Emily Taylor. Welcome, Emily, as well. Emily Taylor has worked in global health for over 10 years, focusing on strengthening high-quality patient-centered health services. Um, her areas of expertise in LMICs, her area of expertise area are in clinical quality improvement, process improvement, and digital health initiatives. She has particular experience in proposal and grant development, business development, project management, strategic planning, and board development. Without further uh, notice, I just want to uh, introduce um, Emily and Paul uh, so that they start the presentation, Vecnakers. Um, uh, before, uh, just a, a brief comment before we get started, they are a part of our webinar series of this month, which is based in ICT for development. They will be talking about um, one of the tools that is one of well, the good examples of e-health solutions that is being deployed and implemented in the world. Uh, just for uh, for um, as a general context uh, e health is electronic processes and solutions that are being implemented to improve health in the world using ICT or information and communication technologies without further to say i will pass it along to emily and paul great thank you so much um this is emily taylor and this is paul amandola um, we're really thrilled to be here. Um, we've been fans of E4C and the Solutions Library and their work for a long time um, and use the Beta Solutions Library to keep, a, keep an eye on the landscape. Um, we are here to talk about you know, specifically what Beckman Cares does, um, our use cases, some of our projects, um, then we'll also be taking a deeper dive into a couple of our projects and looking um, at best practices and key lessons learned and how to apply those. Um, I want to say from the beginning that people should feel free to use that Q&A, um, and I know that we have dedicated time at the end, um, but if we're ever at a level of detail that is either too microscopic or too broad, please let us know because we can tailor the presentation to the attendees on the call, um, and, we're, and we're happy to do that. We want to make it a good use of your time. Um, so we're going to go ahead. Okay, uh, the first thing I wanted to do um, is say thank you because I have been on the side of Jackie and Sam and wrangling presenters and it's no easy feat and they did a really nice job and it's great that EGRC is so dedicated to bringing um, people together and for disseminating content um, and highlighting various projects and looking at ICT for G. Um, so thank you to Jackie and Sam and Yana and Mariella uh, for coordinating all of this and uh, her and Kat's. Do you want to talk a bit about just the overall presentation? Sure. So the the structure of the the overall presentation, we we wanted to give an overview of the the Vecna Cares uh, technology solution, and then uh, a, a more specific use case of how it's implemented and what our approach is in the field. The approach meaning are the implementation approach, but also the approach as to the how the data and the data quality is structured. Great. Um, so just as a quick overview of the flow of the presentation so you know what you're getting into. Great. Um, so this is repetitive, I apologize, but we're going to do a brief introduction to Vecna Cares from where we came. Um, current projects and core use cases. Take a deep dive into the Kakuma and Transmara Digital District case studies, and then talk about best practices and lessons learned. Okay, great. So Vecna Cares is a nonprofit organization. We were started in 2009. Um, we were born of Vecna Technologies, um, which is a for-profit, privately funded healthcare information technology company started in 1999 by a consortium 
of MIT engineers. Um, they decided that they wanted to leverage the intellectual property and the operating procedures that they had garnered from their time um, deploying solutions to established markets and figure out how to leverage them and deploy them in lower resource settings. Um, so it started as a sub-initiative of Vecna. Um, we were initially just uh, um, we were initially uh, a sub-initiative, as I said, and had community service hours. And then with uh, our success and the uptake of our use case and our solutions, we spun off as an independent 501c3. So in the introduction, it mentioned that we're a social enterprise. We're actually certified as a, we're registered as a nonprofit organization. So we do have um, a social enterprise-like business model. The great thing about um, being tied with Vecna Care is we are physically co-located with them. We are two legally separate organizations but we have a lot of access to their expertise around engineering both hardware and software um, and robotics. Um, and we do a lot of brainstorming with them and also are able to use some of their, um, their corporate uh, structures. So we, uh, we benefit greatly from, from being with them. Great. Um, so as a quick overview of Beckman Care's mission statement, um, and we've had a couple mission statements over our eight year life. Um, this is our most recent. Uh, and its intent is to be encompassing. Uh, Vecna Cares designs and deploys information management and technology solutions to create measurable impact, helping people in low resource settings live healthier and better lives. And I know that the title of this presentation is about, um, or the, the series is about e-health and how um, ICT for D and how ICT is uh, strengthening e-health, but it's important to note that what we do, we are not preferentially focused on health. Um, we happen to be doing health right now, and it, it's our, it's kind of our home base, um, but we have a lot of ideas um, and some pilots out about how to use this for education and WASH initiatives and things like that. Um, so I loved that yesterday, um, this is a great segue to our, to our presentation yesterday, Engineering for Change sent out um, a, an email with a lot of great content about ICT, and I loved how the tagline was, how ICT is improving everything. Uh, and my, I think the most important word in this sentence is improving. It can't fix everything. And we really have to remember that whenever we look at ICT for development and when we look at e-health. So the question isn't what could be fixed with ICT because ICT or a technical solution is not a fix. The questions to ask are what current processes could be improved with ICT? what current issues could be mitigated with ICT, and what outcomes could be amplified with ICT. Because as you all know, um, either if, you know, digitizing or automating or whatever, whatever the verb you put in there, if you digitize a bad system, it's still a bad system. So you have to think about is the system, is the process right? And then you have to think about how can ICT bolster those processes uh, and improve your, your outcomes. So our basic theory of change, and you know, this is, not unique to us, this is sort of the e-health theory of change uh, and the access to health data theory of change, is that with better data, with high quality data, administrators, it allows administrators, it allows clinicians to make better decisions. When they can make better decisions, they can implement better programs because they can better allocate their resources, be it human resources, health commodities, um, you know, infrastructure resources, et cetera and with more targeted, better programs that are more tailored and use resources more efficiently and effectively, the idea is that you can improve health outcomes. Okay, so our basic implementation plan at Beckman Cares um, that achieves this theory of change is we do an initial site assessment, we look at community support, we engage community support because local buy-in is so important. Um, we do the installation of our hardware, which I'll get to more in a little bit. Um, we do a central training so that we build capacity at the site. Uh, we do a shadowing period. Um, you know, the intent is that we do a train the trainer and then ultimately we leave um, and the system stays uh, and, and continues to, uh, to serve their needs. And then we do a go live and then we do keep in touch with them afterwards. So Vecna Care's three core competencies are in hardware, software, and what we call data consultative services. And we really see these things as totally intertwined, but also able to be uh, disaggregated from each other. 
we have hardware solutions, we have software solutions that we've developed in-house. But at the end of the day, or actually at the beginning of the day, the most important thing is to find the right solution that works for the setting where we are working. So we can look at hardware, we can look at other companies' hardware, we can look at our software, we can look at other companies' software, but ultimately we're trying to tailor um, the right solution for the setting. Paul, do you have anything else to say on that? Oh, that's good. Okay, great. So um, just to give you a sense of where we came from and where we're going, um, as I said, you know, we started as Vecna Technologies, and you'll see some of the Vecna products over there, which will look similar, which will look familiar to the the engineers and the, any roboticists who are in the crowd. Um, we have some drug delivery, um, you know, physical. Uh, they physically move around a ward or a hospital. Um, and those are widely used in France and in the U.S. Um, and then, as I said, in 2009, Vecna Care spun off. In 2012, we underwent a huge expansion in Africa. In 2013, we started working with um, more U.S. clients and then also some medical missions who do um, pop-up work in um, either disaster relief settings or in low-resource settings. And then from 2014 to 2016, we've experienced really tremendous growth. We went from a staff of about four to a staff of 20. Um, we've had a lot of, you know, our global projects have really expanded um, and we're scaling up. Our next big step is that um, we are deploying, we are developing and deploying a version 6.0 of our hardware. So you'll get to know our hardware a little bit better in the next couple of slides. But um, just keep in mind that we're also currently working on a, um, you know, bigger or smaller, better, faster, <laughs> stronger, cheaper version. So as I mentioned, um, we'll give you a quick overview of our products and services. And um, I still encourage people, you know, if this is becoming too focused on, um, if, if we need to take a step back and talk about eHealth, we're happy to do that. Um, but this is our, this is our um, flagship product, the Clinipac. It's about the size of a traditional briefcase. Um, you can carry it in a backpack. And it was uh, developed, de designed, engineered, manufactured in-house here in Massachusetts. We do all our manufacturing in Woburn, Massachusetts. Um, and what is it is, is it's a rugged, easily portable, solar-powered power management and service. Um, it can be, as I said, it can be solar-powered, it can be plugged into AC power, you can plug it into a car battery, um, and when you power it up and literally just press the on button. I am not an engineer and literally you just press the on button. It instantly throws a local Wi-Fi network. You can see the Wi-Fi antenna on the top left there. Um, and what that means, um, this is intuitive or you know, obvious to all of you, is that any Wi-Fi enabled device underneath that area, which is about 50 meters uh, in radius, can instantly connect to the Clinipac network, to the local access network that the Clinipac has popped up. And any software that is on the Clinipac that has been loaded on the Clinipac can instantly be used by all of those all of those tablets. So really here the the to just break it down, the benefit is that in a clinic, say in a refugee camp, which is one of our core use cases, patients, consumers will come in, they will get registered, they will you know a nurse or an administrator will take information about them, take their birth date, take their name. Then they might send them to a nurse to get their vitals done. Then they might send them over to get some labs done. Then they might send them over to the pharmacy. And previously, this involved paper records. This involved you know, a slip of paper that was easily lost or destroyed. And at the end, they're all stored you know, in a pile. And it's really hard to parse that sort of collection of data for any meaningful analysis. Um, and of course, if you go back to our theory of change, you can't make better decisions if you don't have access to that data. So what this does is the person at registration has a tablet, the person at labs has a tablet, the person at um, vitals or triage has a tablet. And as soon as the patient is entered at any of those points, that information is instantly synced to the Clinipac and then to all of those tablets. So that as the patient moves through the clinic, their medical record both precedes them and follows them with no actual exchange of paper. It also syncs to a master database, which is hosted on the Clinipac and that's a password protected database. Um, and that can produce aggregate level reports, um, which can be used for looking at resource allocation, looking at you know, health burden, et cetera. Um, 
The Clinipad can also power devices. Um, as I said, it's a power management system, so once it has an inverter in it, so once you power it through solar or AC or a car battery, it can then power things over um, using USB or um, Ethernet. And uh, let's see what else I want to say about the Clinipad. Great, so as I mentioned, it throws a local Wi-Fi network. This is just a graphic um, for those of you who are visual like me. Um, this gives a quick overview of how we were helping uh, in the Ebola response in Sierra Leone. So you could have one Clinipac and all providers underneath that dome were able to access information. Again, this is us on the ground um, in Sierra Leone. Uh, in addition to our hardware, we have software, um, which is based on the Vecna patient solution software. The key software functions of the Clinipac software are patient registration and demographics, vital capture, diagnosis, treatment support, case review, administrative tax report, pharmacy and inventory distribution, and patient flow management. Um, those are all pretty typical EMR um, capacities. I want to point out the pharmacy in inventory and distribution because it's pretty unique. Um, we're able to manage a dynamic inventory um, and track uh, prescriptions and dispensation so that people can have a chain of, a quote unquote paper chain of their, of their health commodities. A couple screenshots. Um, we deploy in three different ways, um, and I'll speed this up a bit, sorry. <laughs> um, on the bottom here, you have uh, asynchronous, SAS hosted, and synchronous. Um, the asynchronous is when we are completely offline um, and we leverage uh, ComCare, which is an open source platform um, for conducting surveys. Um, we can also deploy the software as a cloud-based solution, which we do um, in areas with better connectivity. Um, I'll talk about that with the work we do with Special Olympics. Uh, and then Clinipac Local, like we were talking about, is where maybe there's no power, there's no connectivity, but you have to collect sophisticated information and be able to do analyses um, in the absence of that infrastructure. And so you would deploy the Clinipac. Two of our major use cases are in refugee camps and disaster relief, um, e-health uh, and the Clinipac system in particular, and other systems that exist um, can help with the management of camp health clinics, um, the administration of them, like we've talked about the resource allocation, and then also monitoring and evaluation, both for health burden um, and also for uh, reporting to you know, funders and different areas. Um, and then we also have the community health use case um, where we focus on better patient care, surveillance, resource management, and community health work. Uh, I want to take a moment and just run through a few of our projects that show the ways that we, uh, we deploy our different solutions. Um, one is Project I Deliver, which is with Merck for Mothers, and the goal is to develop a digital clinical decision based <laughs> clinical decision algorithm and data capture tool for the interpartum period based on the Better Birth Checklist, which was recently um, released by the WHO. So we work, we are the, the software organization um, and also the, um, the integrator for this with a couple other firms with the prime on it. Um, and the solution that we developed is a customized workflow and data capture tool based on that Better Birth Checklist and it's being locally hosted on the Clinipac node hardware. So that third use case we were talking about where it's locally hosted in areas with no infrastructure. Um, we're piloting it in three clinics uh, in Transmara where we've been working for about five years. So that's great, we're piloting it in clinics that um, are known to us. And we're currently doing some train the trainer sessions and remote support um, from in-country and then also from Vecna headquarters staff. And then next I just have a quick um, screenshot of the, a, a sample screen of the UI of the, um, of the iDeliver tool. And what this shows is a WARD dashboard, which while it doesn't look super exciting to people who are used to EMRs that are deployed in higher resource settings or established markets, having a WARD dashboard of, you know, who, like just a literal snapshot of who's in the WARD, what's their status, what needs to be done next. This is a very simply a task list, um, but it's a huge improvement for, uh, for ward management. As I mentioned, we also work with the Special Olympics. Um, Special Olympics does a really great thing that I actually didn't know about before I started here, but at each of their events, and they have hundreds of events around the world every year, they pop up um, a health screening event where they will have six disciplines. Um, they have you know, about teeth and dental health, eyes, ear health, et cetera, and they have uh, local students and local doctors come and volunteer and do health screenings. In the United States and in Europe, these health screenings 
are great. Um, not as essential because a lot of these kids are seeing doctors regularly because they have complex special health care needs. Um, but the Special Olympics works locally, and these health screenings um, that are co-located with their events are open to the public. So whenever they do an event, the community can, can come and um, also have those health screenings. And it's literally sometimes the first time someone's seen a doctor. Um, so we've piloted so far at 15 Special Olympics events globally, and we're getting ready for a big deployment um, at the World Games in Austria, which we're really excited about. And just to give you a sense, um, I'm so impressed by the Special Olympics. But if you look at the green box in the lower right, you know, they held, almost, you know, one short of 900 clinics. They did 134,000 athlete exams in 57 countries last year. So the potential reach there is great. Um, and it's a huge public health database. Um, uh, we also work with AmeriCares um, where we do a pharmacy inventory management system. They wanted a way to uh, track the donated inventory and then to uh, track where it's going and also be able to tell the funder, tell the tell the donor um, and tell and be able to look from a clinical perspective at what medications were being most um, prescribed. Um, there are opportunities to scale internationally with that. Um, some of you may know AmeriCares does a lot of work in many, many countries with uh, drug distribution and essential commodity distribution. Um, Similarly, we work in two clinics in Haiti with Care to Communities, where we digitize and standardize the outpatient visit workflows and pharmacy operations. And then I'm going to let Paul talk about um, the work that we're doing at Kakama Refugee Camp and Transmara Digital District on a broader level, and then he's going to dive a little bit deeper into the use cases and some best practices and lessons learned. Cool? All right. Thank you, guys. So when you're when you're talking about e-health, a lot of the, the a lot of the challenge focuses around that we're talking about aggregated data, aggregated patient data that's being reported into into an information system uh, through paper forms. For instance, you'll know a clinic saw 300 people yesterday, or they saw 2,000 people last month and for which diseases they saw, but it won't break down to a patient level. There's a the potential there to use, to use ICT, to use e-health, to use digital technology, to get that information down to a patient level to have more of a patient level outcome. So for the next two projects, for the EMR at the Kakama Refugee Camp and for the Transmara Digital District, our goal was was similar for the two projects, to design and deploy a patient-centered EMR. As a patient was going through a clinic, either at the, either at the refugee camp or through the, through the Transmara Digital District, there would be a longitudinal patient record that would be collected at the point of care. When a patient came in through a registration, uh, their profile would be registered, and then the clinician would use a tablet to record their diagnosis, their signs, their symptoms, and then their treatment. Our overall goal for the project, this, this is basically why we were doing these projects. There's no patient level digital data. Uh, there's a high burden of reporting and poor data quality. So let's, let's think about what this means for, for all three of these. With no patient level digital data as a as a patient uh, as a patient was seen over multiple visits or over multiple facilities, their previous medical history was unknown. Doctors would be relying on patient reporting of their own patient history to make a better diagnosis and to use treatment algorithms. High burden of reporting in some clinics, uh, especially in rural clinics. Clinics would be closed for a couple of days a month uh, to collect, to, to tally reports uh, from paper forms, from paper tally sheets onto monthly reporting forms to, to then re be reported into ministries of health or to UNHCR systems. If clinics are being closed uh, for, for a couple of days a month, that means patients aren't being seen. There, there's the potential for digital solutions where 
if data is being collected in real time and being reported in real time, there's the potential to keep the clinics open for additional days per month and more patients being seen. And poor data quality. Honestly, I think that the data quality is just, is so uh, poor in a lot of our in a lot of rural settings that the actual disease burden um, and health status of a population is mostly unknown. As a patient would come into a clinic, they would be their visit is most likely recorded as a as a tick mark on a tally sheet. Uh, that tick mark then at the end of the month is manually calculated and and added to a, a monthly reporting form. There is so much potential for human error, both in the, the diagnosis of the patient, the, the recording error, the, the tallying error, um, that the actual reality between what the information system is saying and what the reality on the ground is can be so far, uh, so far from reality that resources, uh, resources aren't being allocated correctly and patients aren't being treated correctly. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about patient records. These are two different, uh, both from Transmar and from Kakama, what the patient records look like. Even though the one on the right, um, this is from a different clinic in the same refugee camp, uh, looks more organized, it's still, it would be really difficult to, to say with any level of precision what the data collected in those paper forms are and what was being aggregated up to the, to the information system. Our outcomes, uh, what are expected outcomes for the project? Uh, increase in data quality, increase in treatment adherence, um, reduced time for data collection, better use of medication and management, and availability of the data for action. The reality of the ground in, in, both, in both instances, there's unreliable power. So between off the grid or off the generators, power is, power is not a commodity that can be relied on at either the clinic or the hospital level. Uh, the connectivity is very poor. So no reliable internet, no reliable cell signal. And there's a significant problem with human resources, high staff turnover, limited time for training, limited time for supervision and follow-up. This was our plan, uh, a user-centered design process to assess the feasibility of an ICT solution, address the considerations of, of the solution, and then design and deploy. This is our user-centered, our human-centered design meetings at the beginning of the project when we were looking at what our expected outcomes of the project were and going through the, the, the information system um, to structure the approach. All ICT projects, especially around health, um, are going to fall into four different categories. When you're talking about user-centered design, uh, instead of thinking, should we be designing um, an ICT project, it's better to think of these four categories as possible places for improvement. So data collection and data quality, uh, which is simply digitizing forms. Probably anyone on this, on this call uh, would be in a position to digitize a paper form. It's, it's easy to learn, it's easy to deploy. Uh, increasing provider capacity. So in this setting, it was instituting clinical decision support. So providers would be able to have instant real-time feedback on a patient's diagnosis and treatment. Beneficiary knowledge. There's more of a potential as, as connectivity and um, mobile phones are more accessible to instead of always thinking about taking data in, to start pushing more data out to, to beneficiaries. And system strengthening. We wanted to use the ICT solution to strengthen the, the health information system of both the digital district and the refugee camp. 
once we outlined with the with the clinicians uh the data clerks uh the pharmacy management what our ideal solutions would look like we started going through considerations the considerations listed here are a blueprint for other ICT projects and e-health projects that you might be implementing. The considerations represent uh, lessons learned of dozens and dozens of ICT projects in low resource settings. I'm gonna, we'll, we'll go through them one by one uh, with some examples. So the, the most important consideration is the staffing resources. If there is not someone uh, who is owning the project on the ground with the correct ICT or e-health profile, there is going to be a serious constraint of moving the project forward. Um, out of all the considerations of deploying ICT in low resource settings, the staffing consideration, it, it's just, it's the most important one. Uh, it's sort of the make or break decision maker for assessing feasibility. It's also unrealistic in most cases to think you can divide the responsibility of the project up over multiple people. So not 20% of someone's time, 30% of someone else's time. There's a specific ICT profile uh, that needs to be filled and needs to have the, the roles and responsibilities clearly defined. The next consideration, existing technology and literacy. When deploying, uh, deploying a surveillance project in two different areas, uh, it was obvious to see that if, if phones and technology exist in a certain setting, it's a lot easier to deploy. We were deploying a, a surveillance project in, in Congo, in the DRC, and we had to start the training. We had allocated five days for training. It ended up being 10 days of training. Uh, because we needed to go back to a, a level of this is what a mobile phone does, this is what how you turn it on, this is how it's powered. Um, meanwhile, we did the same exact project in Sierra Leone, where the community health workers already had multiple phones, and the training took three days. So there needs to be some assessment of the exist of the existing technology and the literacy level of the of the data reporters. Literacy also does not translate into numeracy. So although someone might not be able to read and write, uh, there's still a potential to, for them to report uh, accurate numbers. Data access and use. It's easy for, it's far easier to collect data on a mobile phone where the, where the challenge is, is data access. What you don't want to do is implement an ICD, an ICT project uh, that will only collect data, but then make a, a lot a lot harder for the data to be accessed. If a clinician is already collecting data on paper, that paper is always accessible. If they're not collecting data on a tablet or a mobile phone, if that data isn't as easily as accessible as on paper, you're now withholding data uh, from someone who needs it. It's just another consideration that needs to be addressed. For mobile coverage, apps uh, that are supplied by most of the network providers are usually inaccurate. And there's no substitute for going to the ground to the clinic uh, to see if the if it's possible to send a signal uh, to get a signal at the actual reporting site. Logistics: What if a what if a reporting device if, if a phone is is lost if a phone is broken. Uh, what's your what are your plans to what's your plans for replacement? Data protection, especially if you're collecting individual level data, what is the plan to for confidentiality, for privacy, um, and what are the ethical considerations around collecting the data digitally at all? Uh, the ethical considerations are, are something that's often overlooked, but it's something that that needs to be essential within the, the feasibility assessment. And uh, evaluation. How do you determine the difference between evaluating the ICT portion of a project versus the actual health services? If a project's not working, is it because the, the digital ICT solution wasn't working? or was the, the actual service implementation of the project poorly designed.
so within the feasibility, this is this is the technical um, assistance you should be providing. Uh, and our our what at Becknacares we're structured to provide um, the overall the overall solution feasibility staffing assessment which hardware and software are most applicable what's your overall cost and then your your cost to uh, sustain the project what the training looks like what partners are available and then how do you structure the evaluation and indicators for both the the service provision and the ICT uh, implementation. One of the key lessons learned is to always make sure your, your data systems are as interoperable, both the data structure and the systems, as possible. There's, a, there's an open HIE initiative uh, which outlines the, the different, the different uh, interoperability levels, uh, the different operability interoperability service uh, layers needed. But this is, a, this is another discussion, uh, a more technical discussion. Uh, several technical yeah, discussions. Yeah, several technical discussions, <laughs> but something key to keep in mind as, as essential in your planning. And then planning for impact. Understanding the difference between outputs, outcomes, and impact. Uh, for a lot of time, for a lot of projects, you're, you're thinking about reducing mortality or having an impact. But the reality of what the routine monitoring data is going to be collecting are just outputs. Um, and then how to structure those outputs to show causality and correlation uh, between collecting your routine outputs and linking them to outcomes for the patient and then impact for the project. Within that evaluation methodology, structuring your indicators to track the uptake of the system with usability indicators and how the system is better improving the, the service provision through efficiency indicators. For example, for, for usability indicators, just tracking uh, the number of users and the number of reports over time will show you a lot of, will indicate to you the the, the uptake of your system. If the system is well designed and something that's helping the clinicians and the staff, it's going to be used. And that's something that's so important to measure because oftentimes, uh, you know, clinics or, or health systems that are part of these projects, um, they're severely under-resourced. So they are loath to give, not loath, I shouldn't say that, they may be reticent to give or reluctant to give critical feedback. And they may say, yes, this is a great system. Yes, it's a great system. Because they're getting computers. They're getting attention. They're getting, you know, perhaps some, you know, a cash incentive um, through, you know, a salaried position um, for that ICT manager. Um, but it's really important to kind of lift the rug on that. Um, and I think a lot of what Paul's talking about is lifting the rug on those design assumptions and the things you hear and looking at the data, you know, there's that great quote, like, in God we trust, all others must bring data. Uh, and I think that's really what we're saying is you, you really do have to, and, you know, as, as engineers, I'm sure you all use data, data, data. Um, you know, you think something, no, show me the data. Um, so it's a great, the usability indicators are really essential for knowing how the system is actually being perceived and used. Uh, this is a, a quick snapshot of a uh, routine evaluation we do around the the qualitative attitude uh, about the information system um, that again just helps track uh, usability. Uh, data quality and results. Uh, this is something important to track. Something like this is only um, possible through collecting data digitally. Uh, this is a real-time example of the, the completeness um, and the quality of eight different clinics uh, within the digital district. So our key lessons learned. Uh, design with the user, uh, bring the infrastructure, manage expectations both around the, the data outputs um, and the data use. Be sure to use data interoperability and uh, structured uh, data standards 
and understand the best use of data. What data is needed at each level of the, the information system? A lot of these key lessons learned were based on the principles of digital design, uh, which are available online and is a, is a good resource to review. And just to, to close out the, the presentation, there are still some ongoing challenges and considerations. Uh, unique patient identification is still a challenge even, even within using technology. It's still difficult to um, correct for multiple uh, patient visits to, to correctly identify um, a returning patient. And there are still security concerns whenever deploying technology to, to low resource settings. So that's it. That um, I think there's time now for for question and answer. So um, thank you so much, uh, Paul and Emily, for it was an amazing and insightful um, analysis of the e health challenges, specifically what you have encountered in the field. Yeah, we have um, time for Q and A, and I will uh, kick it off with the first question. Um, so you mentioned that you at Vecna Care disaggregated hardware, software, and consultancy. I'm really curious uh, how you do that. And you also mentioned um, that you actually separate which side is failing in a project, and implementation of the project, is it the ICT side or the health side. Can you elaborate a little bit more about like how Vecna Care is handling these issues? Yeah, it starts with an assessment. Um, likely an assessment of what your what the the program is really looking to measure and then an assessment of what the reality is on the ground an assessment of the the resources um sort of the consideration slides uh but starting with the data and starting with the the measurement objectives uh and then going through there and uh, assessing what's the what's the what's the best software um, in terms of software we provide or other software available, and then uh, a hardware assessment of what the connectivity is in the, in, in the setting and what's the, what's the best solution. Yeah, and then in terms of the second part of your question with how we, you know, determine if it's the you know the ICT solution or it's the health or it's some combination thereof. You know one of the things you're talking about with the usability indicators and also those attitudinal quant qualitative measures and you know cross-referencing the attitudinal attitudinal measures or things like on this slide where you see HR stability and these are anonymous surveys that we give to um, staffers in the clinics where we're deploying, if they, you know, reveal to us in an anonymous survey that there's real instability in HR or leadership really isn't engaged, you'll see a direct correlation in terms of, you know, how well the system is being used. Um, and so if it's being, you know, used very well um, in areas where staff satisfaction is high and then not well used in areas where staff satisfaction is low, let's look at the, you know, what's our variable there. It's, process and its staff attitude and its leadership attitude. So making sure that we, you know, I come from a quality improvement background and a process improvement background. And that's why, you know, I always say if you digitize a bad system, it's still a bad system. Um, what, you know, ICT for D, um, one of the things that it can do uh, with health is that it really elucidates those issues and, you know, makes them pretty glaring um, and it can be messy. You know, things often get worse before they get better in terms of process um, because you can really pinpoint um, where the problems are uh, and and where the system's failing. And during that assessment, um, it's important to, to remember that when, when you're looking at information systems, when you're looking at data flow, a lot of times digitizing might not be the solution. It's if you're seeing um, if you're seeing challenges with a difference between what the what a program's aiming to collect and what they are collecting, if their data collection tools aren't correct, it's it's still more appropriate it's more appropriate in some cases and in some settings uh, to just use paper, to just have a better structured paper system, collect the data that the program's aiming for. 
and that's just that's part of the assessment process as well. That's great. Thank you so much for that answer. It's uh, very insightful, and of course, that's the the, the direction that eHealth is moving towards. Kind of, you know, mixing that like paper based and digital, because we know now after so many years of experience that it's actually the case. You know, bad systems don't work, as you mentioned before, and so you need to fix the system and then digitize them. Uh, we have another question, um, and this is very specific. They're asking if is the um, um, Electronic medical records or IT systems stand alone, or has it been designed to some type of e uh, electronic medical uh, record standard? Um, is it like standalone, or has it been designed to some type of uh, e EMR standard? For example, does it does it or will interface with full functionality to an Epic site? So the sort of a two-part question. Um, yeah. When we are looking at the reality on the ground in the places we work and the level of information that is currently collected, um, as Paul was saying earlier, you know, the data collected at a site might literally just be a number of fevers seen in a month. Um, so going from that to patient level data is a huge improvement. Going from basic patient level data around vitals and diagnoses and, you know, a longitudinal patient record about, you know, your BMI over time, if you're looking at malnutrition, is a huge, it's a huge leap to something like EPIC. Um, we are not as complicated as EPIC. Um, we are designed to standards, you know, we, since we um, piggyback on the Vecna um, systems, you know, we are this is a little bit different, but like, you know, we're HIPAA compliant, we can export an HL7, um, all those sorts of things, but it doesn't interface with an EPIC system, um, if, if that's, if I understand the question correctly. Um, and then I see part two of that question by Bob, are you going to use yeah. the system to provide diagnoses and did you want me to answer that one as well? Yes, yes, please, yeah. Okay, yeah, this is a this is a great question and the project that we're doing with Merck, the I deliver. you know, we talk, um, Merck is, you know, obviously incredibly fastidious about um, whether or not things are classified as a medical device. Currently, it does not provide diagnoses, um, so it is not considered a medical device. There is um, in the works potentially integrating what we've developed with iDeliver um, with a predictive algorithm known as SELMA, which is a simplified uh, electronic, simplified effective labor monitoring to action um, algorithm that does provide um, not quite diagnoses, but you know, like clinical care recommendations. At which point, um, the actual software may have to get that classification, but currently, it does not. Great. And if you can address, like this next question, we have just two minutes left, but it's a very good question that Gary put here. What's your approach to updates in hardware and software, and on the ground equipment? Like, how do you do to up, uh, update? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. So yeah. one of the things that we quickly realized was that, you know, so we have these, and I'm going to I'm gonna loop this in with the, the previous, the question right above, um, how technology can be deployed in rural remote areas and how we did it in Kenya, because um, they're really linked. So in Kenya, we have about 35 clinic packs at about 35 clinics right now. Um, and since they're all offline, you obviously can't do mass updates to all of the software. Um, and so what we have is we have a field team um, based in a city in, in Kenya, in Kilgoris, who does regular visits to the clinics. Um, the hardware itself is really, really designed and optimized to be used in rural settings. You, we actually um, put it against a wall and put up like a cage around it because if people can access it, they try to fix it or they try to like mess with it. And really, it's just best if left completely alone. It's meant to run all the time. It's meant to just be hooked into the solar panel or battery and really not be touched. Um, the software, you know, is also designed to be, you know, really rugged and not require um, a lot of troubleshooting. So for updates, um, what we do is our software team here will send um, upgrades to our Kenya team who will then go around and perform the upgrades on, on the actual hardware um, so that we can up, update the software. Um, 
That's super interesting. Thank you so much. Well, the time is up, but I just wanted to thank you, Emily, Paul, and everyone who attended. As a last bit of information, I posted on the chat the link to the Solutions Library, uh, an offering here at Junior for Change, that this product is in. So you can take a look at that as well to learn more about um, uh, this product that Vecnikers offer. Um, I want to thank you uh, for attending, um, and have a great day.